This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. Uh, hey, John, I've asked you to unmute. Do you need anything uh, in advance for setting up your live stream? Hello, everyone. Uh, we will be starting in a couple of minutes, uh, just letting uh, more people have RSVP to hop on. Thank you.
everyone. We're just getting the live stream going. I want to make sure that uh, folks who are looking on Facebook Live are able to see us. So once I get the go ahead, we will start. Um, if you're a journalist, you should have the press release with our quotes in your inbox. And if not, you can um, contact Cecily and she'll make sure that you get it. Thanks everyone for, for being here and looking forward to hearing your questions as well in a few minutes. I'll just wait to get the thumbs up from George and then we'll start. Great. Thank you all again for coming today. When abortion is illegal, women die. Abortion care is basic health care for women and one of four women will need an abortion at some point in her life. 60% of women who obtain abortions are already mothers. Today marks the 48th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And it is the first Roe anniversary since the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Well, Justice Ginsburg was not yet a member of the Supreme Court when they made their landmark seven to two decision that guaranteed a woman's right to choose. Her impact on women's rights is unmistakable. A lawyer, a mother, a champion of equity and a role model for so many she recognized that women can only be full participants in our society when we have the ability to make our own reproductive decisions. And about abortion rights specifically, she said the following, this is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make for herself. And when government controls that decision for her, she's being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. Women are people, and when we lose the ability to make our own reproductive decisions, to control our bodies, to chart our own destinies, we're treated as less than people under the law. Until very recently, really just until the last 50 years or so, uh, when the notorious RBG was fighting to change it, women were treated as less than equal under the laws. Our inferiority was written into the laws, and here in Wisconsin in 2021, our inferiority is still written into Wisconsin's law. Because if you look in our statutes, if you go online right now, you'll see that we still have on the books a law from 1849 that makes abortion a crime and turns doctors into felons facing years in prison. We know that criminalizing abortion doesn't make it go away. It doesn't reduce the need for abortion. It just makes it more difficult and dangerous, and especially for women who are already vulnerable and marginalized. That's exactly uh, what's gonna happen if we do nothing. In Wisconsin, if the uh, US Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, abortion will become illegal and women will die. Anti-choice politicians have worked hard for many years to limit access to not just abortion, but to birth control and even to accurate health information. Now for many in this country, Roe versus Wade is already functionally gone because abortion is so inaccessible and difficult to get. And conservatives have plotted for decades to pack our courts with right-wing ideologues who are hostile to women, women's rights. And thanks to Donald Trump, they have finally succeeded. Now we face the very real possibility that this could be the last anniversary of Roe versus Wade. We must act immediately to remove this threat that Wisconsin's 172-year-old statute poses to every person who could become pregnant and everyone who loves someone who could become pregnant. That's why my colleagues and I today are introducing the Abortion Rights Preservation Act to finally repeal this dangerous, archaic statute that makes abortion a crime. Um, and I wanna thank the very many colleagues from the Senate and Assembly who have joined us this morning as well. Um, I'd like to introduce an incredible woman who works every day on the front lines to facilitate the health and well-being of women and families. Tamara Thompson is a doula, lactation counselor, childbirth educator, and writer. She's also a leader in Wisconsin's reproductive justice movement as a co-founder of Maroon Calabash. Tamara, Tamara is also a co-founder of Harambe Village, which is a community-based organization that provides direct services to women and families, and they are working on the front lines to end racial disparities in maternal and infant health. Please help me welcome Tamara Thompson. Thank you. In my everyday role as an interdisciplinary doula for the past several years, I've spent majority of my time sitting in the living rooms or at the kitchen tables with pregnant people here in Wisconsin. 
The families I'm sitting next to are not only seeking the physical, emotional, and informational support of an experienced doula to help them weigh out their options, but they're processing their pregnancies. They're trying to navigate a complicated insurance policy, if they have one. They're trying to figure out how they're going to get time off work or school. They're trying to figure out where the money is going to come from, how they're going to secure childcare for their other children, and more. One thing that I know for sure from my line of work is that access to abortion care is access to basic health care. Another thing I know for sure is that abortions won't stop with legal bans. Only safe abortions will stop. One thing I know for sure is that laws that seek to criminalize anything is that people of color will be disproportionately penalized. So let me be clear with that. If we do not protect families here in Wisconsin and their access to abortion, we will ensure that some groups, especially poor people and people of color, will be disproportionately punished when seeking access to safe abortion care with their trusted health care providers. The U.S. criminal justice system already has unjustly penalized communities of color for crimes that wealthier white communities already commit um, and get slight punishment for. The studies have shown that despite black and white communities doing drugs at the same exact time, black Americans are more likely to be stopped, frisked, and persecuted at higher rates. So by criminalizing abortion, by extension, it forces medical care providers to interrogate their patients, their pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriages, to question every comment that they make, and to conspire with law enforcement to persecute someone who is seeking medical attention in order to save their own skin. That's horrific. And it'd be irresponsible as us as community members to allow that to happen. And this is why I'm urging the support of the Abortion Rights Preservation Act today. I'd like to introduce the next person who's going to be speaking. The name is Amanda Schmiel. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Amanda Schmale, and I'm an OBGYN here in Madison. I've had the privilege of caring for hundreds of Wisconsin women over the past decade of my career. I've been with my patients for the highest of highs, with the birth of their children and the lowest of lows, as I'm holding their hands during an unexpected lethal prenatal diagnosis. Shortly after the passage of the 20 week abortion ban here in Wisconsin, one of my patients had the misfortune to experience the cruelty of this restrictive and archaic law. She was pregnant with her second child, a very much wanted child who would add a son to their family. At the 20 week ultrasound visit, which is the visit that most parents are anxiously anticipating the first views of their much anticipated and wanted child, they instead had the devastating diagnosis of a fetal lethal diagnosis. Their much wanted son had a skeletal anat anomaly that was not compatible with life. And if, even if he did survive the pregnancy, he would not live more than minutes outside his mother's uterus. To complicate matters more, in order to deliver this pregnancy, if it was taken to full term, she would have to undergo a C-section that would otherwise not be needed and would put her life at risk as he could not be born vaginally. His parents were understandably devastated and after much counseling decided the best decision for their family would be to terminate the pregnancy to protect the mother from the very real risks of pregnancy and a surgical delivery. Due, the due to the timing of her diagnosis and the current restrictive abortion laws, this was now illegal in Wisconsin. Her only options were to risk her life and continue the pregnancy or come up with $2,500, travel to Chicago, and miss out on much needed income during the three days of the procedure out of state. Medically, I was out of legal options with which to help her, so I started a crowdfunding campaign, a crowdfunding campaign for her family to help her cover her expenses. I'm happy to report that she un underwent an uncomplicated procedure and they have since added a beautiful child to their family. My role as a physician is to help counsel my patients as to the best treatment for a woman and her family. Sometimes this means preparing them for an unexpected complication in pregnancy. Sometimes it means performing a termination of pregnancy. Wisconsin women 
Wisconsin women need and deserve comprehensive reproductive health care. This includes access to abortion. By criminalizing abortion, the lives of thousands of Wisconsin women will be put at risk. My patients deserve to be able to make their own health care decisions that are based on scientific evidence. They deserve the right to full access to abortion services. They deserve to do this without the interference of undue political restrictions. This is why I support the Abortion Rights Preservation Act so that physicians like me can care for their patients without risk of criminalization. Thank you, Dr. Schmael. Um, I'm State Representative Lisa Subak, and I'm really thrilled that we are here today um, introducing the Abortion Rights Preservation Act. Senator Royce and I and many of our Democratic colleagues have gathered here on the anniversary of the Supreme Court's landmark Roe v. Wade decision to introduce this bill because every single day, as you heard from the doctor, women in our state face the deeply personal decision of whether or not to continue a pregnancy. Every pregnancy and every woman's circumstances are different and we should respect their decisions. Anti-abortion Republicans in Wisconsin and at the federal level have worked for years to dismantle access to abortion care, one new restriction at a time. In these last few years, we have seen a wave of new abortion bans in states with the clear goal of overturning Roe v. Wade. The death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and subsequent appointment by former President Trump of yet another conservative anti-abortion justice has tipped the balance on the court, making the threat to safe and legal abortion that much greater. Earlier this month, in its first abortion-related decision since the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett, the Supreme Court ruled with the Trump administration to limit access to medication abortion during the pandemic. Given recent appointments to the Supreme Court and the latest ruling limiting abortion access, it is clear that the threat to safe and legal abortion is the greatest it has ever been since Roe was decided in 1973. Wisconsin has had a criminal abortion ban on the books since 1849 that would subject a doctor who provides an abortion to a felony conviction and up to six years in prison for providing a safe and common health care procedure. Anti-abortion Republicans want to enforce that law, and Roe v. Wade is the only thing standing in their way. No matter what decision a conservative Supreme Court makes, we need to make sure that Wisconsin women can make our own personal health care decisions based on what is best for our health, for our well-being. If Roe v. Wade is reversed, Wisconsin women's health and safety will be in jeopardy. And that is why today we are here introducing the Abortion Rights Preservation Act, which would repeal Wisconsin's antiquated and dangerous criminal abortion ban. We all want to be able to live safe and healthy lives and to be free to define our own paths and our own destinies. Yet we cannot truly be free if we cannot make our own decisions about our bodies, our lives, and our futures. Once someone decides to have an abortion, it should be safe and free from punishment, free from judgment. Providing abortion is health care, not criminal activity. The time has come to modernize Wisconsin's outdated abortion law so that our state treats abortion care like all health care with regulations that are reflective of current medical standards. The Abortion Rights Preservation Act will preserve the rights of Wisconsin women to make these deeply personal health care decisions without interference from politicians, no matter what an ideologically driven conservative Supreme Court may do. I'm now going to go ahead and turn it over to George Gillis, who will facilitate questions from the media. Members of the media, if you have questions, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom, um, and George will call on you. When it's your turn, please go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, as Representative Subek said, we will be taking questions uh, using the raise hand feature. Um, if you don't know where that is, uh, click reactions and then raise hand. Thank you. And while we're waiting, I just want to take a minute to uh, acknowledge the wonderful legislative colleagues who are joining us today virtually. Um, aside from myself and Lisa, we have Senator Chris Larson and representatives um, Deb Andraka, Diane Hesselbein, Francesca Hong, Jill Billings, Jody Emerson, Christina Shelton, um, Sandy Pope, and Sue Connolly. I think I got everyone. Thank you for being with us. Oh, Lee Snodgrass. Thank you. All right. Uh Seeing no questions, um, oh, here we go, have one. Uh, Melanie Conklin from, uh, there you go. We know Mel. <laughs> Sorry, Melanie, you are on. I'm sorry, Melanie, we can't seem to hear you. Um, uh, we will double back with you, uh, uh, Melanie, offline. Uh, anyone else? Oh. Please hold while I have technical difficulties. <laughs> Am I unmuted now? But yes, but you're very echoey. Okay, how about now? Much better. Okay, okay. had to turn. I actually logged in on a different computer because it wasn't working. So and I've got the other one turned off. So I have a question just on the uh, from a political practical side, not having read the act yet. Um, obviously, Wisconsin Republicans are probably not going to rush to embrace this act. Um, how, what can be done given the changes that have happened this past week on both the the national scene, where we have a pro-choice president uh, and Congress and Senate um, now, but then also on the local scene where we have a governor who will probably, you know, veto any bills that are anti-choice, but you're not going to be likely to get anything to his desk through the Senate and Assembly. What are options for someone uh, like yourselves who are uh, looking to make sure that abortion, uh, women in Wisconsin have abortion access? Oh, great question. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, certainly at the federal level, this is a great opportunity for us to pass the Freedom of Choice Act, which would um, guarantee in federal law uh, not just um, in case law, the right to choose. Uh, that would certainly help us regardless of what happens with the Supreme Court. Um, you know, here in Wisconsin, I think it's, it's important, even though we know that the Republicans are not going to all of a sudden change course and start caring about um, women's health, it's still important for us to be introducing this legislation and drawing attention to what the consequences are for Wisconsin women and for physicians if Roe is overturned. You know, um, you know, people say, oh, well, if Roe is overturned, it just goes back to the states as if that's a minor thing. But for women in Wisconsin, um, that's a catastrophe. 
And we need to be holding Republicans accountable, uh, not just for saying, well, we don't like abortion. We disagree with it. We think it's wrong. What they want to do, they don't, you know, all those things may be true, but the problem is that they don't just think it's wrong. They want it to be a crime. And, you know, when, when abortion is a crime, you know, it, you're, taking away a critical health care option that is a normal part of women's reproductive lives. And we need to make sure that they own that politically. We can't just give them a pass. Um, you know, year after year, uh, pro-choice advocates have tried to repeal this law and have brought attention. And now, you know, more women uh, and more journalists, I think, are aware of the fact that Wisconsin does have this outdated ban. Uh, and that's, you know, that is part of our job in the legislature is to draw attention to laws that are wrong and to, um, to do our best, even if we're not politically able to change it right now, I think we will be in the future. We're gonna have new maps. Uh, there's gonna be a federal government that is much more interested in healthcare as well as uh, women's rights. And we need to take advantage of that by uh, you know, doing everything we can at the state level to prioritizing this. Could I follow up on that? Um, is there anything that can be done at the state level uh, with Governor Governor Evers? Anything that could be achieved through, you know, I think there's there's this battle in state courts, obviously, over executive orders and power overreach, and you know, it's become on every every issue we see. But is there anything that can be done um, without the cooperation of uh, of the legislature? I, you know, there. Oh, go ahead. Uh, that's a question that I know we were asked a couple of years ago too, um, when we introduced the, introduced a similar bill and the governor had just been elected. And I think, you know, this is something that is codified in our statutes and we need to remove it from our statutes. And it is not something, the governor can't simply remove something from our statutes. So we do need to start moving the legislative needle on this. Um, I, you know, I think it's important here today, the story that we heard from um, Dr. Schmail that of one of her patients. There are um, millions, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, I don't know the number, um, but there are many women out there who face similar stories, who have their own stories to tell, who make the decision to terminate a pregnancy for a variety of reasons. And we need to be telling those stories because that is what eventually moves the needle and makes a change on this issue. You know, I also think it is critical that we continue to introduce bills like this, even when we are not at the point that they're passed, because if we don't, it will never happen. If there aren't any other questions, I have one question for the healthcare providers that we have here today too. But I don't want to monopolize things if anybody else has something. Go ahead, Mo. Okay, um, for for the the healthcare providers, um, this is slightly off topic, although I think also very related and uh, uh, something people are interested in knowing. What have you seen during this this time of the pandemic in terms of women health women's health services? How has it impacted that? Um, you know, not just abortion, but also also abortion. What what changes have you have you witnessed or experienced? Um, well, I definitely have noticed that there is not, people are afraid to come into the doctor because they're afraid to be exposed to COVID and the pandemic. And I think people aren't getting their normal preventative health care that they usually would come in every year and get their birth control refilled. I have seen numerous cases um, in my work at Planned Parenthood of women who couldn't go to their doctor to get birth control and then they were faced with an unintended pregnancy. It's a real thing. Um, I don't have the numbers to support that, but just in my own practice, I've definitely seen both less access to birth control and more unintended pregnancies. And I'm, I'm not a medical professional, but I do work closely. Uh, with mm -hmm. medical professionals, with people as a doula. And I would have to echo the same thing that Dr. Schmail said, is that people are less likely to go to the doctor already. Um, there's already a strain put on people who are, 
you know, just grappling with transportation, if they're going to be taking a bus, if they have childcare, if they're going to get their birth control that they already had. Um, so I've seen also people um, were highlighting women's health, but I also want to draw some attention to um, children who get pregnant, essentially, um, and people who are members of the LGBTQ community that find themselves pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy and then are also navigating um, how to get care. Um, like anti-choice uh, advocates are usually um, under the guise of it being for health and safety, but I find that in direct conflict because the same people are voting against the expansion of Medicaid. So how are people going to access mental health and regular preventative care and regular comprehensive annual care, and then also be hit with the double whammy of not having um, access to abortion care? Do either of you have an example um, that you've seen that you could share, obviously without names or, or anything identifying? Uh, one, one I would say, um, I had a client who found out that they were pregnant while incarcerated. And of course, when a person is in jail, they do not have access. Um, and so with all of the restrictions that are already imposed on people who are under um, is some, some level of the penal system, whether it's home su court supervision or house arrest or those types of things, um, my particular client was not able to get access to abortion care. Um, and that has had a devastating toll on their mental health. So that's that's one story that I would I would share just a snippet of on the the ongoing effects of COVID and um, the restrictions that are in place for my client anyway. Yesterday, I had a client at Planned Parenthood who was a mother of three young boys already, was not able to get time off of work and have the transportation to go see her doctor to get her birth control refilled, and then found herself with an unintended pregnancy and not with the financial or other support of um, the partner that's led to such pregnancy. And she was devastated. She had the money to pay for the abortion. She didn't have, you know, she was barely holding on to the job that she had and supporting her kids and all the things that are going with that, on with that um, and lack of child care and everything with COVID. All right, uh, thank you, Melody. Um, one last call for questions. All right, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you. Thanks everyone, thank appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 